We get a lot of questions about sample rate uh, and its influence on power when measuring um, power on inverter driven machines. So this is a presentation that our colleague Alexander Stock did, Dr. Alexander Stock, uh, on sample rate requirements and their influence on active power. So I think this will be really interesting for anybody who's, who's had to measure inverter driven machines and hopefully clear some things up. So the question is really, um, as power analyzers and data recording equipment goes towards higher sample rates, I would say one mega sample versus 15 mega samples, um, what are the benefits or, or is it necessary to increase the sample rate? And I think we'll come to the answer that no, no, it is not for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages to higher sample rates? And how should filter settings be utilized to get the best power results? And, and I think this is going to be key is understanding our filter settings um, because that's going to drive a lot of what we do. So let's get into it. Let, let's find out why there's really no benefit to sampling higher than one mega sample. I'll ruin the surprise. Um, so in, in this study, we, we do a simulation. Uh, so we're simulating a two level inverter on a permanent uh, magnet synchronous machine. And this is modeled in MathWorks. So this is a simulation. Um, so we can actually call it kind of truth. Um, but that said, we are discounting a lot of uh, EMC, EMI things that are, are just going to complicate this. But this is the base physics. Everything just gets more complicated from here, uh, which we do believe is, is another motivation for lower sample rates. Um, so here, here's a basic topology. And, and this model was made by uh, Ka um, Kuhlman at TH Schaffenberg, so in uh, over in Germany. Measurement setup, and, and this is really just making it so that anybody viewing this can understand exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, we're measuring the, the three phases of current and the three phases of voltage. Um, we're using an artificial star, so we are we are faking out the neutral, um, which is a perfectly accepted way of doing it. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the instant pack, instantaneous power, U1 times I1, U2 times I2, U3 times I3, so on and so forth. Um, and then our active power is the average over a time period, which, which is on the you know cycle basis. Um, so just the just the definitions for active power, just to set the scene. This was this was done by a PhD, so you know we we got the details. Um, so what are we modeling? We are modeling ideal waveforms. So again, these are ideal switches, so it's not the perfect simulation, but I, I think we get the point across very clearly. Um, so your switching frequency is eight kilohertz uh, as seen in the blue. So we see our voltages. Our fundamental frequency is 24 hertz, um, which we can see more clearly in our currents. And then our, our sampling frequency, which, which is, we're allowing us to call our ideal waveform is one giga sample. Again, we're modeling this. So we have this kind of perfect one giga sample um, simulation. So we're calling this, you know, our, our, our ideal setting. So from there, let's see what we're looking at. All right, our active power definitions, again, we're just going to define the hell out of everything. Um, active power of a quasi-continuous data set um, where F continuous is significantly greater than the sample rate. Um, you know, we basically get our power equation is we're going to take U times I for all the samples and divide by the number of samples to get the average. Um, active power sampled at the, the sampling frequency, the same story. Um, just now we have the number of samples is, is that ratio. Um, so our active power deviation is our sampled, which is kind of our, uh, uh, um, our different sampling rates that we're going to be comparing, minus truth, which is our continuous over the truth to get our relative. So we have the equation for truth, we have our equation for the sampled, and we're going to go from there. Again, one gigahertz is truth um, and the various sample rates. So let's set the premise for the fact that we're dealing in reality. And we have physical sensors and we have physical acquisition systems. Um, then, so, so when we make the measurement, we need to set filters. What do we set our filters to? Well, our current sensors have a bandwidth, usually somewhere in the 200 to 500 kilohertz range for the really high accuracy, high bandwidth flux gate sensors. So right off the bat, we're seeing that 500 kilohertz is our negative 3 dB point. That is going to be the limiting factor. So right off the bat, you know, something like 15 mega samples out the window. 
Um, we then look at you know your your acquisition card, which which HBK makes, where we have this bandwidth of you know one megahertz uh, to one point three five megahertz, depending on your settings. That's negative three dB point. So what's the limiting factor? It's the current sensor. If this is now 15 megahertz, the limiting factor is still the current sensor. Once this technology improves, things might change. But for today, this is what we have to deal with. So the CTs are going to define our filter setting. We want to filter below that 500 kilohertz bandwidth of the current sensor. So one of the examples we're going to look at today is 200 kilohertz filter. We also need to make sure we have equal filter settings for voltage and current. And we're going to see an example of this as well. Because if we filter at different settings, we're introducing a phase shift and we're now just messing everything up. So even if we you know, sample super high on our voltage and current, that current sensor is introducing a low pass filter. It has a bandwidth. So again, we want these guys to have the same filter settings. So we're gonna set it to 200 kilohertz so that our voltage and our current have the same filter settings. So let's look at some examples. And this is the fun part. All right. Our first example is kind of what we see as the ideal example. We're taking a 200 kilohertz negative 3 dB point, first order low pass filter. You know, you can be as fancy as you want with your filter, but, but this is just our example. So we look at our ideal signal. This is the gigahertz not filtered. Our active power is 2.139 kilowatts with zero deviation, because this is truth. Next up, we look at the 10 mega samples. We see 2.139, we have 14 parts per million deviation, 0.001% deviation. That is not achievable with accuracies of current sensors or, um, or acquisition systems, let alone the combination. So this is like incredibly no deviation. We look at the two mega sample version, 2.1389, almost identical. 24 parts per million. Again, this is well below the measurement uncertainty of our sensors or our cards, let alone the noise in the environment. So what we see is really the exact same measurement for that 200 kilohertz filter. And that 200 kilohertz filter is defined by the fact that our current sensors have a bandwidth of around 500 kilohertz. So we see a very small influence in sample rate in the ideal setting of 10 mega sample and two mega sample really nothing difference when you consider that filter. So right here, you could stop. I'm now going to show some other examples because I'm sure there's some more questions uh, because I think they lead to some interesting conclusions about some of the questions you might have. Let's now filter it like crazy. Let's look at the two kilohertz filter example. Um, we now see the ideal signal is not filtered. Again, zero deviation. Um, the 10 mega sample has a 0.03% deviation, and the two mega sample has a 0.038, almost identical again. Um, but we now see that the accuracy is a lot worse because we're getting rid of a lot of those higher order effects. We're getting rid of the harmonics, we're getting rid of the switching. So what we see is that the switching effects are strongly damped. We have a much bigger deviation than we did with 200 kilohertz. So if you care about accuracy, why would you filter that low? Um, so this is a question of why would you do this? And I'm sure there's reasons if you want to understand your fundamental, but there's other calculations for that. But it becomes clear that the driving factor for active power is in the fundamental. And that again, if you're filtering this low, those sample rate differences mean nothing. They're out the window. Um, so again, the deviation is smaller than the measurement uncertainty of the sensors or acquisition system. And we're getting rid of a lot of other effects. So that 200 kilohertz filter looks really appealing because we get those switching effects. We get the harmonic effects, the fifth, the seventh, the 11th, the 13th, and the fundamental, which is where most of our power is. Now we get to the fun ones. What if we look at no filter? This isn't even possible because that current sensor sets the filter. But let's look at the world of no filter. The 10 mega sample is better. So when current sensor technology improves, we're going to want to look at higher sample rates, but we don't see that in the near future at the accuracy rates we need to justify it. Also, the measurement for no band or no filter is significantly worse than the 200 kilohertz. I mean, 0.01 versus non-existent, 0.15 versus non-existent. 
So what we see is that this isn't really realistic because we have that current sensor in the loop, because we have that limiting bandwidth factor. So I think this is also you know, very interesting that, yes, the 10 mega sample is better in an unrealistic situation. Um, so please take that into account. Now let's look at my favorite example. This is the example if you run 10 megahertz switching frequency with you know a five megahertz bandwidth with a current sensor, which you're going to do. So we see here our 10 mega sample has a 0.49% accuracy. Our two mega sample is a 0.65% accuracy or a, a deviation. So like both of these are gigantic, albeit the 10 mega sample is better, but this is so inaccurate, it doesn't matter uh, if you if that's what you care about. Why do we see this huge jump if we have a filter on our current, but not our voltage? This is introducing the, the situation of our current is filtered by a sensor, but we have no filter on voltage because we're using the bandwidth of the card. We introduce that phase difference. And by introducing that phase difference, we blow up our power accuracy. So we see an aliasing effect, uh, which is better for the 10 megahertz. That's why it's marginally better on the accuracy. But the different filter settings in voltage and current lead to significantly different deviations. And this is so much worse than having both filtered. This is the situation you run into if your current sensor introduces a filter, but your voltage is not. So if you go out there and you run a five megahertz bandwidth with a current sensor in the loop, you introduce that phase distortion and you are screwed. Um, so I think this is really interesting and it really pushes for, let's just have a 200 kilohertz filter on both voltage and current, you're going to get the best results. So the conclusion, um, measurements are always filtered by the limitations of the bandwidth of the sensors. Filter settings and cutoff frequency should be selected in a way that they're high enough to be able to consider the switching effects, but low enough to avoid inconsistent measurements, um, aliasing, uh, bandwidth in the CTs. You need that filter low enough with regard to the sample frequency, again, to avoid aliasing by about a factor of 10. And you want it equal for voltage and current to avoid those phase shifts. And remember, when you're using current sensors, set the filters lower than the current sensor bandwidth to avoid inconsistent currents. There is really no advantage to going above one mega sample. Honestly, most of our customers are running at 500 kilohertz and perfectly happy because their switching frequencies are in the 8 kilohertz range. They filter to 100 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz, and they are golden. Um, so I hope this helps. I and mean, there's a lot of questions out here. And, um, you know, HBK, we can always dive into the details. You can talk to Ms. Dr. Stock himself, uh, and we can really go through this with you. But thank you guys for listening, and I hope you enjoy our uh, channel. So please subscribe and um, we'll meet with you soon. Um, thank you.